Canal and River Trust are the charity who look after and bring to life 2,000 miles of waterways because we believe that life is better by water. We have to do a lot of work to ensure that the waterways remain a great resource for us all to enjoy, as well as being important habitats for wildlife. So we thought we'd show you how we do this. Our ecologists have the important task of ensuring the waterway habitats are the best they can be for our wildlife, from our historic structures to under the water. Hi Megan, I'm Laura Mulholland, ecologist for the Canal and River Trust. Hi Laura, it's nice to meet you. You too, thanks so much for coming out today. I'm going to tell you about how we've got this really important study where we're looking at the habitats along the canals and how important they are to bring habitats into the cities through these green and blue ribbons that the canals provide. I'm so excited to see the work that you do and it's a glorious day for it as well. Yeah, and if we're really lucky we might see some wildlife today. Yeah, sounds like a good day out to me. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, I have to say habitats like this are really special for me. There's something that really connects you to them and gets you excited because it's home to so many different types of species. Absolutely. I mean, being beside the water is just so calming anyway. And then when you have a day like today, when the sun's out, the birds are singing, it's just <laughs> such a beautiful place to be. Yeah. And where we are here, we've got these softer bank habitats, which are fantastic for species that are in decline, like the water vole, who use their front teeth a bit like a JCB to dig out their burrows, which I just think is so cool that they're just there with their little teeth. <laughs> digging away and then we've got these fantastic reed beds as well which are really great sort of in the middle of the summer when the reed and sedge warblers come they'll build their baskety nests in there and so you can walk along the towpath and see these water voles and the birds it's just such a beautiful place to be yeah. it's amazing isn't it because I can walk along reed beds and things and you don't necessarily see the animals, but that's not always the most important thing because if you could hear them or some sort of evidence that they're there, that's really exciting because it's the mystery of what's going on in those rebeds. It's like a drama for wildlife that you're only getting a short glimpse of and it's so important we protect habitats like that. Absolutely, and it's really important that we try and bring these softer bank habitats into the cities where you've often got sort of steel piled sides to the canals uh, or it might even be concrete, but we've got these floating reed systems that we're going to be uh, bringing some more in uh, and that will allow uh, the plants to grow and then the insects will come in and forage on the plants and then hopefully we can bring more and more wildlife into the city so that people can connect with it. Absolutely because the wildlife is out there it's just getting it into the hearts of the cities and hearts of people's minds as well. I suppose one thing that's really important in cities with a lot of water in it like this one is the water quality because that's causing so many issues isn't it? Yeah that's right, um, there's often uh, surface water runoff will go into the canals uh, both in the cities from the traffic and in more rural areas from the surrounding farmland and that can cause an over enrichment which can then cause algal blooms which is then bad news for the, the animals that live in the water because they can find that the oxygen drops right out. Yeah. Um, but having the open water in the cities is just so great for people to be able to connect to that. And the sound of the water running over the weir, I, just, I love that sound of moving water. It's just so good for your mental well-being. It is, I guess it just connects people as well because, you know, if we're aware of what's going on in our waterways and our open water like this, then we're going to be more empowered to act to do something to protect it as well because it's right on our doorstep. It is. It's, I mean, this waterway is just on so many people's doorsteps. Yeah. They literally just come out of their front door and a couple of minutes walk and they're on the canal next to the water seeing all of the animals who will call this home all of the different ducks and the birds in the trees it's just a fantastic habitat yeah exactly and all different levels from aquatic plants to birds it's just excellent we've heard that it's really important to understand what kind of surface water runs into our canals so we're going to learn more about the impact that has and how it can lead to eutrophication when nutrients from fertilisers get washed into our canals from surrounding farmland, a process called eutrophication occurs. Fertilisers contain nutrients like nitrates and phosphates, which cause algae to grow and reproduce rapidly. 
algae blooms can form on the surface of the water, preventing the light from reaching the plants below. The submerged plants die as they are not able to carry out photosynthesis. The bacteria that feed on the dead plants and algae use up the oxygen in the water as they respire and grow. Water without oxygen is called anoxic. Aquatic life forms like fish and insects are not able to survive. Now, thinking of canals and bridges and things, I mean, a lot of this infrastructure was put in during the Industrial Revolution and everything like that, carrying really important goods and stuff into the hearts of cities. But actually, you know, now it's been taken over wild wildlife and it's amazing to see what moves in when you give it the chance to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these canals, some of them are 200 years old, even more in some cases. And these structures, like this really old bridge behind us, have been here for hundreds of years, giving wildlife plenty of time to make their own home out of that structure. Something like this bridge, you could have bats roosting up in the gaps, cracks and crevices. You could have um, birds nesting in some of the holes. Sometimes reptiles and amphibians might come out and bask in the grass that's growing over the top of the bridge just a fantastic habitat. Yeah, it's so important, isn't it? Something that could be deemed as kind of man-made structure, something that, you know, we're the only species that gets any use out of it. But when you look in the details, you look in those cracks and you see a bat, you know, hibernating or in torpor in there towards the end of the spring season, or you see those invertebrates, you realise just how important those structures can be if we give wildlife the chance to move back in. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's, it's those structures that animals can then make a home of, even in the really urban city centres. We've got some pillboxes along some of our canals that we've prevented people from being able to get into because sadly they were just using them like giant litter bins. But we've created habitat inside them for bats to come and move in. And so that will hopefully give the bats a really safe and secure, temperature stable place that they can move into right in the heart of our city centres. I love that and I love bats as well and I'd love to see you know more bats around the city centre. I mean I live in central Southampton and I don't get to see many other than when I go to the outskirts of the new forest and such and it's such a shame and we've just got to learn to be more tolerant and share our space with the wildlife. Absolutely I mean the canals are a fantastic super highway for bats there's everything they need they've got the shelter from the trees and the hedgerows on either side they've got ample food foraging over the water surface and then those waterways come right into the city centres but they also in the opposite direction can go quite into really rural areas where there are woodlands and places that bats are going to be roosting it's just a great super highway. We've seen that buildings and structures in urban areas can be great places for wildlife to build their habitats. However, there can be problems for our waterways in these places too. Pollution can cause toxins to be present in the water, which we can observe in different ways. The amount of dissolved oxygen in our canals and rivers is an indication of the amount of pollution and toxins they may contain. If we notice fish gasping for air on the surface of the canal, it could be a sign that something is wrong. We use an instrument called a DO meter to measure the concentration of oxygen dissolved in the water. Another good indication of oxygen levels in water is looking at the type of organisms we find there. Bloodworms and sludgeworms can tolerate very low oxygen levels but stonefly larvae only thrive in water that is high in oxygen. Water with rich biodiversity is usually a sign of a healthy environment. So walking along, you've got gorgeous canal on this side and on the opposite side, something which people could walk past and think, oh, it looks a bit messy. And I'd always argue the messier the better because this is scrubland is so great and it's so biodiverse and we need a bit of mess sometimes in our gardens and things, don't we? Yes, yeah, scrubland is a habitat that people often don't really think of as a, as a habitat because it's just sort of an untidy area where we've let nature do its own thing. Yeah. After the storms, some branches have come down so we've left them there and then the wood decay beetles will come in start foraging on them lay their eggs in there which will then feed on the dead decaying wood which is then also uh, absorbed and broken down by fungi which are just incredible yeah i feel like in this country you know and elsewhere i mean we're just obsessed with having manicured lawns neat and tidy 
everything you know but actually just letting an area grow wild has such catastrophic impact for biodiversity it makes the world of difference it gives something a home so you know a place that might seem messy for us actually is critically important when it comes to climate as well absolutely and those dense brambles that will provide blackberries in the autumn for yeah. us and for the birds but through the summer it's going to be one of the first things that's going to be a suitable for birds to get into and build their nests in and feel protected from predators so we don't want to chop all of the bramble down it's really important to in appropriate places let it do its own thing yeah it's great. we've got over 100 species of bramble in the uk have we that's, really cool. that's awesome i think it's 108 but i have to check that statistic but how good and i love bramble bramble picking you know going out and picking blackberries and stuff yeah you know it doesn't get much better than that and you know for us and for everything else it's just you know hands off for a time being yeah. and it's brilliant the other species that's really important in scrubland and we've got some here is ivy it's one of the first things to provide um, pollen and nectar for insects in the spring one of the last things in the autumn and also it's this got this lovely dense structure for birds to build their nests in uh, and be hidden away from predators so we should leave ivy standing rather than tidying it away i think there's something that we can all take away from that you know whether that's in our gardens or communities or just going out and about in the countryside and seeing areas that look a bit messy but appreciating it for the biodiverse rich habitat that it is yeah absolutely i've had the most fantastic day out and about exploring with the canal and river trust it's amazing to see the work that's being done firsthand to see the wildlife and the habitats that they're directly benefiting through their work and we've seen some amazing views already and some incredible benefits but ultimately, no organisation, charity or individual conservationist can ever do enough. We always need more help and we need you to get involved now more than ever and help us take action for the benefit of our environment. And of course, there's multiple ways that you can do that, whatever suits you best. So you can get involved with the Spot That Habitat survey, which means that you can go out and about, see the habitats that live around you and send in information to us. And also you can go online with this online game called Tap That Habitat, which I think sounds rather fun, where you're seeing photos and images and you can analyse them from the comfort of your own home, your car, wherever you happen to be and send in information that way. Citizen science is vital. We need all hands on deck and all eyes on board for this project because of course facing this biodiversity and climate crisis it's really important we do something now. So use your voice, get shouting, get sharing about it and get involved. We hope that you've enjoyed this session. To find out more about the work we do visit our website canalrivertrust.org.uk forward slash stem and be sure to play Tap That Habitat.